come to the end of 1st Peter, and we look at these last few sets of verses, I want you to go to Let's go to verse 5, and we're going to look at the last part of that verse. But it starts, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to the elders. Yes, and this is where I want to start at this morning. Yes, all of you be what? Why is it important in the Christian walk to be submissive to one another? exactly what I was going to say. And that is, if we can't submit to one another, then do you really think you're going to be able to submit to God? Very well said. And there is strength in submission. Because believe me, is it harder to bite your tongue or just let it flow? Right? There is strength in submission. And so, Peter counsels us in our day-to-day -day lives and in our interactions with each other, how we are to relate to this world and how we are to relate with each other. And that relationship is based on submission. The whole Christian experience is an experience of submission. The world does not like that word. We as individuals do not like that word, but if you want to see God, you need to learn how to submit. You want your prayers answered, you need to be in a spirit of submission. Why? All of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with, what's that next word? You cannot have submission if you do not have humility. Why do you need both of those? It tells you very plainly because God resists who? The proud. the proud. Now, you need to understand that Peter is not talking about the world here. and He's not talking to those people in the world. He's talking to Christians. And you're thinking, well, we're Christians. We should be humble and submissive. Peter understood the human condition. But what he's telling you is that, listen, you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ. And you have made a commitment through baptism to show the world that you have given your heart fully to Him and now you are called Christian. Don't let that name be trampled in the mud. When people see you, and they see you work, and they see you live, and they see you talk, let them see Christ. Let your witness be just that, a witness. And let it be a good witness for Jesus Christ. So, God resists the proud, but gives grace to who? The humble. If you want your prayers to be heard and answered, then you need to not just approach God with humility and submission, but you need to deal with your brothers and sisters the same way. Do we not pray for each other? Now, answer this honestly. Who do you want to have pray for you? Someone who is arrogant, who God's not going to hear? Or someone who's humble, who God will hear their prayers? Why do you think people go to certain people and ask them, will you please pray for me? Because they have confidence that God hears that person's Prayer, right? Why is it that a lot of people will ask somebody, please pray for me, because they think God will hear their prayers more than their own? Verse 6, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in what? Don't you wish it ended right after this you? That's 
fallen humanity. I want God to exalt me now. I'm tired of suffering. I've suffered enough. I'm ready to do it for the exaltation to come, right? But the exaltation does not come except in what? Due time. Whose time? God's time, which is why it's due time. And not your time or my time. Okay. And this is why you have to have a spirit of submission. Because when things are not going the way you want them to go, and when they consistently don't go the way you want them to go, and you start to lose your submissiveness, and you start to lose your humility, you have to remember that it is not about us. This is about God. Think about this. Why do we come to church? Why do we come to church? Hmm? Yeah, ask Siri, why do we come to church? <laughs> Who do we worship? God. Do you know the phenomena of worship in 2015 is worship that is centered on the person instead of the God they claim to worship? Think about this. This is contemporary worship today. It is what God is going to do for me, what God is doing for me, what God has done for me, what I hope he will do for me. And it's all about me. But do you realize, this is why what I mentioned before we started the worship service, that every week it's the same thing. Now, if you want to mess up a worship service in the Adventist church, change that first song. <laughs> There's a pastor here who did that, and every week the people would sing that song we just sang. There'd be a different one in there you'd want to sing, but it's it. Okay? Change the song that you sing after you pick up the offering. And it doesn't matter what number you put in there, the people will sing that same song. What? Habit. Habit. That's what we do. But listen, this is the problem with when worship becomes habit. We lose sight of who it is we're worshiping. Do you actually think that when you step into this room here and we come before the Lord, like I said, that heaven opens up, just like it did for John in vision in the book of Revelation, and he was taken up in vision and he was right there before God's throne? Now I want you to think about it. It says that the saints will stand before the throne of God. How big of an area will that be? Right? Is it enough for this little church here with all you people to be transported there? Is it enough for the Daytona church up the street to be transported there? Because we're worshiping at the same time. Is it enough for all the churches in the state of Florida to? Yes. And it's enough for all the churches around the world. But we don't think about that. You really think about that right now you have entered into the very presence of God. We bring Him our worship. We don't ask Him to come down and be with us. We want to be with Him. Worship today brings God down to our level. What worship is meant to do is bring us up to God's level. This is why it is very important what it is you worship. How you worship. The manner, the style. The music that's played. This is why every once in a while we have to tell the congregation that when you come in to keep the talking down low. Why? I used to drive me nuts when I first came into the church. Like, wow, you guys are really uptight. <laughs> you have a lot of rules. <coughs> Man, why? But it's for that exact reason. Who are we reverencing? The building? No. You are standing in the presence of God. So listen, this is why Peter writes this. 
that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. It's actually a quote from Proverbs. Therefore, humble yourselves under what? Because you cannot approach God in our arrogance. And human beings can be very arrogant. I know this because I am. God blesses us with position. He gives us the opportunity to be used by Him to speak to people, and we become arrogant in that. And we start to think, look what I'm doing. And you start to listen to the words coming out of your mouth, and you're thinking, well, that sounded pretty good. I guess I'm pretty smart. Until you have that person who's actually an English teacher come up and say, where did you go to school at? <laughs> <laughs> this is why when we come and worship we need to remember why we worship is it God who's worthy of the worship or is it us in a lot of churches today it's us and it's all about me This, brothers and sisters, is why when I first came to my first Sabbath worship with Adventists, I stayed. Because I realized that their worship truly was done in the beauty of holiness. That the church that I went to, there was no drums on the rostrum. The music they played was hymns, and, and I've always loved hymns, and I still love hymns. Now, I love contemporary music. I listen to it all day at work. Okay? And there's a time and a place for everything, but when you come before the throne of God, and for a uh, two-year period, I was going to an uh, Alliance Church of God, Sunday Church, brother. Um, they had the whole full band set up there. The people were beautiful. Loved the worship. But there was something there that made me feel very uncomfortable. And that was that they spent the majority of their worship singing. And that shout now Patty, you are a musician and I am not. And understand this, the heart and the mind of the musician is different from the heart and the mind of everybody else. That's not a musician. What touches you is different than what touches me. Music touches you deeper than what it does me. The greatest thing about music, musicians, is that what they're able to say in a three-minute song But when that is all the focus is just on music, and the music is more about what God is doing for you, what you want Him to do for you, what you're hoping He will do for you, and it's not directed towards Him, you understand what I'm saying? It has become now worship of me, a self-centered worship. Do you guys understand that? I love to hear the Word of God preached. And I love to hear pastors who can preach the Word of God. And I listen to Christian radio and I hear Christian pastors, and there are still a lot of really good Christian pastors, but the newer ones are more like psychologists than psychiatrists. I've watched Joel Osteen, and I've watched Oprah Winfrey, and I don't see too much of a difference between either one. But when I was a part of a congregation 
that the people brought their Bibles, the people opened their Bibles, and the people knew their Bibles, I realized that I wanted to be a part of that. I want to be somewhere where the Word of God is dealt with correctly. Where it is given to the people in truth. And that's what I find within the worship of the Adventist Church. So Peter continues to say that, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God because it's all about Him. Everything that we do is all about Him. My mother asked me one day, and she was having a bad day, and she asked me, why does God just always want to need our praise? Because she was thinking in the human mind. Okay? She was thinking of an arrogant human. I want your praise. I deserve your praise. Just look how good I am. Okay? Is that why God wants your praise? Is that why God deserves your praise? Do you understand why it's all about God? Because truly He is worthy. Do you understand your true condition outside of Jesus Christ? There is nobody here in this church right now that is good. Not one. That outside of Christ, you're all condemned to hell. And not only are you condemned there, but you deserve it. That's the hardest part for us to understand in Christ. That we deserve the punishment that God has given to those who will not accept Jesus Christ. We deserve it. This is why it's all about God. Because God has made a way for us who are imperfect, who are sinful, to become perfect. Sinless. Able to stand in His presence. That's what makes Him worthy. And that is why everything that we do in the worship service should center and focus on Him. Because He is worthy. Amen. And He will exalt you in due time. Casting all your cares upon Him. Why? <coughs> do you realize that God cares so much about you that He cares enough to allow you to hurt let me tell you something. That is somebody who really cares for you. I can tell you I love you. I can tell you that I would die for you. And not do it. And not really care about you. And give you everything you wanted. How many of you raised kids? Did you give them everything they wanted? Why? Because it's not good for it, right? God loves you so much that He will withhold things from you that you really, really think you need and that you really want because He knows it's not in your best interest. And He will allow pain to come into your life so that you see where your heart really is. God does not give or cause pain because He doesn't like you. He doesn't give or cause pain because He's mean and a tyrant. God allows pain to come to show you where your heart and your faith is. It's easy to say, I trust God when everything's going well. And there's no bumps in the road. But your faith is actually tested. The Bible says that God tries the heart. God tests to see the purity of your faith. <coughs> and so He will allow pain to come to show you where you stand with Him. And how strong your faith really is. Where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are. And in due time, if you keep your eyes focused on Him, if you keep your faith in Him, He will exalt you. He will never leave you and never forsake you. Through those hard times, He is always there. But listen, how many of you guys, and this should be unanimous, know people who have not accepted Christ? Raise your hands. Who have not accepted Christ, who are not saved. Is their life easy? Yes or no? Is their life easy? Sometimes. Okay, sometimes? 
Sometimes we think it is. Now, how many of you know people who have accepted Christ? Everybody should raise your hands because hopefully everybody here has accepted Christ. Is your life easy? This is one thing you and unbelievers have in common, and that is your life is not easy, no matter whether you're rich or you're poor. Do rich people, they never have problems? How many rich people commit suicide? Whitney Houston's daughter was found where? Why? And did she have money? Did she have happiness? Okay. Her mother, how was she found? Did she have money? Did she have power? Did she have happiness? Apparently not. Michael Jackson? Did he have power? Did he have prestige? Did he have money? And yet, he could not sleep at night, so he used to give himself a drug that they would give you to perform operations so you didn't feel the pain. He says it's the closest thing that brought him to death, and he'd come back. And he enjoyed that feeling. There's something wrong with that, right? Did he have happiness? Money, wealth, prestige, the love of this world, and everybody loving you will not give you happiness. So, Christians and non-Christians, have one thing in common. Life isn't easy, is it? So wouldn't you rather suffer and have pain for a reason than suffer and have pain for no reason at all? This is what kills me about evolutionists. Okay? If this is all here by chance, there's no order to anything, it's all random chance. Marty, if you suffer, it means nothing. If you don't suffer, it means nothing, because when you die, your life has meant nothing. Stephen Hawking would back me up on that. Life means nothing. Don't you want your life to mean something? When you follow God, the pain that you suffer and you experience is for a purpose. God is not going to keep you from pain. He loves you enough to let you go through it. But it's for a purpose. Purpose. And the purpose is so that your character becomes more and more like the character of Jesus Christ. You're created in His image, and God is going to keep you in that image. Okay? So, He will exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon Him. Never forget this. God does really care for you. Whether, whether your life is good or whether your life is really bad, there's no difference. He's no respecter of persons. God loves you and cares for you. This is the greatest thing about God. Now, how many of you want to have a relationship with somebody you don't like? How many of you want to have a relationship with somebody who is your actual enemy, who if they could, they would kill you? You do? Okay, you're the only one. Nobody else said it. So I, I bow to you on that. Think about this. God wants to have a relationship with you while you were yet still his enemy. And who was it that actually put Jesus 